I'm glad you asked that for your glory, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I love you, Lord. How do I turn these off? Will it just pop up here, or what do I do? It should. Can you tell me in just a second if you see me? Hi, Ginger. Oh, you can see me? I can. Oh, I'm uh, I'm currently uh, starting the Facebook Live. Hi, Hi. it's just you and me right now. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> Hi. How did it go on Friday? What was that? How did Friday go? It was such a marathon. It it was amazing. Great. Like I keep checking the stats, and like more than 900 people have watched it, Fantastic. and it was a 13 hour marathon. It was yeah. like. 15 speakers from, okay. no, no, 20 speakers, 15 countries. Fantastic, um, good for you, that's fantastic. What did you want me to, to read for your uh, bio? You want me to just read off of your website? Yeah, let me see if I can quickly just uh, send something in the chat right now, hang on. And just read that. I'm gonna um, click to go live on Facebook, is that okay? Yeah, and so I have PowerPoint slides. Do you, how would you, do you want me to use them? You or can not? share it, right? Yes, I can. I can share my screen. Is that a Does good Does it look, list? do you have the button to share? Um, let's check. Uh, you have disabled it. So if you could. Okay, so I can make you the host though, and then you can oh, take over. Oh, you can over. just enable participants to share too, whichever way works for you. Um, so I click on the participants and I say more. Allow to record, assign, to type closed caption, rename, put in a waiting room. The only way I know to do it is to make you the host That's after fine. I introduce you. Is that okay? Nope. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a little bit hard to hear you. Is that by design? Uh, I don't think so. I'm just using my laptop, so I'm not sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, that's okay. Hi, Trace. Hi. <laughs> I love you so much. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm going to go introduce you. You put something in the chat for me? That's the bio, yeah. Uh, there it is. Okay, here we go. We're going live right now. Oh, wait, let me just title it. Dr. Tracy... Akim, Alloway. Did you see the uh, pictures I made you last night? Yeah, they look great. Thank you. Yeah, you look great. I love that. that that's why I'm wearing yellow. It's like my favorite picture. Uh -huh. It's like my favorite color. Um, last. So we had all kinds of different niches. The thing that we had in common was that almost everyone was multilingual from a different country. Amazing. So, um, but I mean, we had like health and nutrition and mindset and like a $50 million a year entrepreneur, uh, 30 under 30 winner, things like that. It was just, it was tremendous. But I wanted to give you like a little feedback on Fantastic. all the different speakers that That's were there, okay? Absolutely. Okay, hold on, here we go. Now it should be live. Setting up your meeting for Facebook Live. Drum roll. Did it pop up? It says it's streaming live on Facebook. Woot woot. It's, are you on face, uh, transform your life? Well, let's see here, pages. I believe we are there, let me see. Okay. There's just a tiny delay usually. Yeah, here we are. We're live. Yeah, just oh. scroll down a little. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. I'm so excited that you guys are here. Thank you for all you warriors that stayed with us. I was shocked that there were actually people that stayed with us for 13 hours on Friday. The, um, the replays have been up and I'm going to leave them up all the way till midnight tomorrow um, because uh, there's so many countries involved and, and time slots. So you guys be sure to get on there and hear from all the different amazing speakers uh, giving you advice in their niches on how to transform your life. My last guest, uh, a friend of mine, one of the authors I had on the show on Friday said, uh, Ginger saved the best for last. So um, that's how I'm going to introduce her. This is Dr. Tracy Packiam Alloway. She's an award-winning psychologist, professor, 
She's a skateboarding professor, you guys. She's so cool. Um, she's an author of over 13 books, TEDx speaker. Uh, uh, she's um, authored over 100 scientific articles on the brain and memory. She has also provided consultancy to the World Bank on reading in developing countries and is a sought after speaker internationally. Her research has also been featured on BBC, Good Morning America, the, uh, sorry, the Today Show, Forbes, Bloomberg, the Washington Post. We're in the middle of greatness, you guys. Um, the Washington Post, Newsweek, and many others. She was also featured as an expert in the documentary, The Observed Life. This is my friend, an amazing woman, Dr. Tracy Packiam Alloway. Let's say hello. <laughs> woo, woo, woo. Hi, <laughs> I'm coming to you from Florida and I've known Ginger since the university. So it's really exciting to be part of this amazing event. I heard Friday went really well. And I know that um, you're excited to get going. So I'm gonna um, stop my video and share my screen which hopefully will go smoothly. Um, I'm gonna make you the host so that you can do that. Okay. There you go. Perfect. Take it away. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us today, Tracy. This is amazing. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> I haven't seen Tracy in forever. We were on the stage together, you guys, in college. <laughs> we both studied psychology in undergrad together. <laughs> Well, as um, Ginger mentioned a little bit, my area of research expertise is in memory. I've led multiple government funded projects looking at how memory can be improved over time. And so what I'd like to share a little bit today for all of us is some brain hacks for a better memory. Um, I'm not sure how this how it's been done on Friday, but I think what I'll do is I'll just go all the way through my information and I'm happy to have a little Q&A if that's okay with Ginger at the end of this. So we can have a chance to um, you know, ask any questions or any Absolutely. clarification have interest. Great. So just to get started, um, as I said, my area of research expertise is in memory. And if you're with us, you can play a little game along with us. Um, if you can think of the word Calgary, um, if you've heard of that word before, and if you can try to spell that not forwards, but backwards. Uh, just take a couple seconds if you want to do it along with me. But hopefully this is what it looks like when you spelt it backwards. So not too difficult. Let's try another one. Think of the word Kazakhstan and see if you can spell that word backwards. Um, I won't wait too long here, but hopefully you have some of the letters that we see in here. Now I'm guessing that you found one of this a little bit harder than the other to do. And that's because that illustrates how our memory works. When something is familiar to us, it's much easier for us to remember that information. So maybe a word like Calgary is somewhat familiar to us and it's not too difficult or you can sound it out. Um, so it's not too difficult for us to be able to write that in backwards order. In contrast, a word like Kazakhstan may be less familiar to us. And while we may have a general idea of some of the letters involved, we may have misplaced um, some of the letters and syllables. So we do know that a memory works much better with information that is familiar and highly frequent to us. So that's an important thing to keep in mind as we think of how efficient and effective a memory is. So let's have a little sneak peek under the hood, um, if you uh, don't mind, and think of where our memory is housed. So my particular area of research expertise is in something called working memory. And working memory is housed in the front of the brain, the prefrontal cortex. So if you touch your forehead, that's where your working memory is housed. When you're trying to integrate information, when you're doing a job interview, when you're having a conversation with someone new, when you're trying to remember a name and connect them with someone else that you know, all of those kinds of activities involve your working memory. And that's using your prefrontal cortex, the front of the brain. Now you may have noticed now, I've used this image of the post-it note a couple of times. And I like to think of this image of a post-it note as a shorthand for how our working memory works. And that's because our working memory does have a limited space. We don't have an endless amount of capacity in our working memory. It is um, sort of capped out and a specific number uh, of information that we can keep in mind. That's one key feature of our working memory. Another feature of our working memory is that it does not work alone, but it works in conjunction with other areas of the brain. 
So for example, when you're reading something, your working memory works together with your language area of the brain, also known as Broca's area. So it draws on the words that you have learned, the statements that you know, and pulls that forward into that, that post-it note in the front of your brain to do the comprehension part. So Ginger mentioned to me that a lot of us uh, here today are multilingual speakers, and all the more so your working memory would rely very heavily on your Broca's area or your language center. So if you notice, you may be having a word finding difficulty where you may say, oh, what, what is that word again? What am I trying to say? It could be your, not your working memory that's letting you down, but your language center that's letting you down. That's not kind of shuttling that information up to your working memory for conversation. Your working memory also works with the IPS, that's your math center. So if you're doing a little bit of mental math or maybe you're trying to calculate some sales in time for your Christmas shopping or your holiday shopping, it's your uh, IPS that keeps those math facts and your working memory that pulls it out to do multi-step equations. Your working memory also works with your amygdala, that's your emotional center of your brain. So when we think of regulating emotions or mental health, things like depression and happiness, anxiety. It's your working memory that can act as a buffer for how we encode incoming information as optimistic or pessimistic, and then ultimately how that affects our mental health. I won't spend too much time talking about that side of my research, though I have uh, published a considerable number of uh, um, research topics on uh, specifically how our memory affects our mental health. And so I'm happy to delve more into this, uh, this topic in the Q&A if that interests you. Our working memory finally also interacts with our hippocampus. That's our long-term memory. So you can think of your working memory as a library. This is an image of a uh, well-known library structure and our, our working memory draws on the facts that we have saved maybe uh, that's geography, maybe science facts, any kinds of facts that we've saved and pulls that out from our long-term memory. Now, if you have a, a parent or grandparent that is um, getting older, you may notice that they may struggle with some of their sentences or some facts. And that could be that the pathway between their prefrontal cortex, their working memory, and their uh, long-term memory, the hippocampus, is degrading. And that can result in that difficulty in communicating as well. So there's lots of reasons for why our memory may fail us. And one big reason for that is that the link between our working memory and other areas of the brain are not working as efficiently. But don't worry, we'll look at different ways in which we can maximize its efficiency today. Now let's try a little quiz if you don't mind today. Um, I'd like us to do a little activity. Um, and this is from a cognitive test that I published with Pearson, um, Pearson Education. Some of you may be aware of them. I uh, published, have published a couple of tests with them and both of them are working memory assessments. And this particular activity that we're gonna have a peek at is from that test. And if you're interested, I also have created an app version of this that will be released in the next couple of weeks. So you can keep your eye on the um, Google Play Store if you're an Android user or the Apple Store if you are an uh, Apple user. And so you can actually test your working memory. It's all scientifically based. So you can actually compare your results with other people in the same age group. So it's based on data from thousands of people from different demographic backgrounds. Um, so that's just a little aside. If you are interested in knowing a little bit more about your working memory, uh, you can keep checking on my website um, or look in the app store for AWMA, which is the acronym of Automated Working Memory or Alloway Working Memory Assessment. But let's try this activity together. If you're watching with me, oranges live in water. Is this true or false? It's not a trick question. Let's try another one. Lions have four legs. Is this true or false? And um, now, now that you've answered these questions as true or false, do you remember the last word from each question in the correct order? Hopefully, um, you will say water and legs. And if you have, well done. You have the working memory capacity of an average five-year-old. Um, now here you can see, I'm gonna just present a little bit of uh, how our working memory develops across the lifespan. And this is also based on research that I've published. Uh, we had a few thousand people from as young as five up to 75 years of age. 
And I've used a sun. I mentioned to you at the start of this presentation, I'm currently based in Florida and Florida is known as the sunshine state. So I've used a sun to represent how much information we can remember and work with at each age level. So if you're a five-year-old, your average limit, your average post-it note size is two. So you can remember two words, two numbers, two phrases, two pieces of instructions. Now I was speaking to a group of educators and a kindergarten teacher from Boston came up to me afterwards and she said, now it makes so much sense why my kindergarten class struggles. And that is because I often give them three or four instructions. And now I know that this exceeds the average capacity of a five-year-old. So as we get better uh, older, as you can see in our 50s, even up to our 30s, we can typically remember and work with anywhere from five to six pieces of information. So to put that in context, the activity that we just did, the game we just played about oranges lives in water and lions have four legs, um, that, that test, uh, you can remember about five or six sentences about that. Now, as we get older, in our 60s, our working memory starts to look like an average seven or eight year old, where we can typically work with about five, uh, excuse me, three pieces of information. So this just gives us a little snapshot of how our working memory develops across the lifespan. Now, I have a question for you. Is your attention worse than a goldfish? Now, one of the things I often hear as a researcher and as a psychologist is whether, you know, various things like social media and technology are ruining our attention. And one piece of research was actually published that found that um, most people hold an atten have an attention span of about six seconds, which is less than a goldfish, uh, which averages seven seconds. Now, that is a bit of a misnomer. The, the study had several flaws, which I won't actually get into. But one way to do that is to try to look at multitasking. Now, I'll just play this little video here just briefly, and we'll just, uh, excuse me, I'll turn the volume down for that one. Uh, but have a little fun. If you want to look at this video as I'm talking and place your hands on an imaginary steering wheel, place your feet on an imaginary brake and accelerator, don't forget to stop right here and drive along with this image here. Now, as you're doing that, I would uh, like you, I'm going to present you a series of numbers and I want you to remember them in backwards order. So let's start with three numbers. Now keep driving, keep driving, don't stop driving. So we're just gonna play this little game for just a, a short time. So you're driving five, seven, nine. Say that back aloud in backwards order. Let's try it with four numbers. Two, eight, three, five. Say that in backwards order. Let's try one more as you're driving along over here. Four, one, nine, six. Say that in backwards order. Right, so we stopped at four just to give us a little chance. I'm gonna stop the video here. Um, that's a little bit of fun here to show us how multitasking can impact our working memory. Now, um, some colleagues of mine at the University of um, Utah published a piece of fascinating research showing that only 10% of us are what they called super taskers, which means that only 10% of us will do equally well when we do two things at the same time than if we were doing each one independently. So they measured people driving and they measured people doing a very similar memory number game that we just did together. Um, and then they looked at them doing both those things together and found that um, actually most of us struggle when we have to, to multitask or do two things at the same time. So something to keep in mind, if you are trying to remember some important information, multitasking may not be the best way forward to maximize your memory. 
Now, here's what I found in my research. You can see the super M for a super memory that in my own research, I found that actually technology can shift the way we use our attention. And I have a whole TED talk on this. Um, you can find that on YouTube on the, on the uh, uh, TED carousel of TED talks. But one of the things I found is not so much that technology and social media decreases our attention, but rather it shifts how we use our attention when it comes to memory. So if you think about a spotlight approach, before um, it, we used to think of attention as a spotlight where we focus on just one thing at a time, that spotlight focus. So you do one activity, you shift your spotlight to the next activity. But in my research, I found that people who are active users of technology, things like social media and so on, they actually had a different way in which they use their attention. They had a floodlight approach. And this means that they were shifting the way they were using their attention to being able to look across the scene. Like the, the word floodlight illustrates, they could take in a lot of incoming information simultaneously and then process and work through that. So my argument is that yes, technology, social media has changed the way we use our attention, but it's not necessarily a negative thing. It's just shifted the way in which we use our attention. So we've gone from a spotlight to now a floodlight approach. Now the hacks, the brain hacks that I'm going to share with you now uh, about how to have a more efficient, a better memory, they can be found in a couple of my books here. And I do have a new book that's coming out in the new year called Think Like a Girl, where I talk about how our brain works and how to have, you know, how to maximize our strengths. But just for today, I, this is a, a quick guide. If you, if you want to look into some of the tips that we're going to talk about today, these are all available on Amazon. So I have divided these little brain hacks into slow acting. So if you have a few weeks and you don't mind waiting and you want to see that wonderful cumulative effect of what you're doing, your habits and your behaviors on your memory, I have some tips that are slow release. If you're a little bit more impatient and you're saying, you know, I don't, I don't want to wait a few weeks. I, I want to see this better memory sooner rather than later. Well, not to worry, I have some in the moderate acting category for you. But finally, if you're just saying, you know, I want something right now, what can you tell me right now that it can improve my memory? I also have some quick uh, tips for us today. So something for everyone. So let's look at slow acting. Um, and as I mentioned, together with the memory tip, I do have a 10 week program that'll be coming up on the app store as well, together with the memory test that will give us uh, everything based on the five senses, all based on scientific research on how we can improve our memory. So here's a little sneak peek from some of them. And it's what you eat. Um, this is from one of my books that's available on Amazon, The Working Memory Advantage. And I call them sustainers, boosters, and sparkers because of the way in which they work to improve a memory. So there are lots of different ways and foods that we can use. Um, the sustainers are things like dairy uh, and meat. The B12 in meat, the carnitine, really improves working memory. The boosters are foods that are flavonoid rich foods. Um, so I'll, I'll go ahead and show you the slide here for the sustainers. B12, now low levels are associated with dementia. Now, all of these that I'm going to discuss, all the science for these um, food tips do take a few weeks before you can see benefits. And that's why I've labeled it as the slow release or the slow acting. But um, B12, we know that low levels are associated with dementia. And here are some food sources that can improve your B12 levels and improve your memory as a result. So if you're not a big uh, meat eater, you do have tofu, eggs, and dairy as options as well. Now, if you're looking for boosters, these are the category that can actually inhibit neuroinflammation uh, and neurodegeneration. And so we see things like blueberries and strawberries. And I put here some of the studies um, that, and, and some amounts here uh, that, that uh, the participants took on a regular basis. It's over a few week period, typically a five week period. And brain imaging confirmed benefits to memory regions of the brain. Now, flavonoids are the foods that 
are rich in color. So think of the green in spinach and in kale, the blue in the blueberries. And they're quick lookup guides for foods that are rich in flavonoids if you want to find more. But this one is one of my favorite. I, I love dark chocolate. And one study found that chocolate with a high level of cocoa solids at 70% cocoa solids or more can actually increase blood flow and neurogenesis. So although I put this in the... Um, the uh, slow acting category, if you do have a little bit of chocolate or in these, as we start inching towards the winter months, the colder months, make a hot chocolate with some dark chocolate and you can see memory benefits, not just a little enjoyment as well, but your memory will show benefits that can last up to two hours. So those are our boosters. And finally, our sparkers are ways to actually improve or spark the synaptic plasticity in the brain. So imagine your cells talking to one another. Remember, we looked at the brain, your working memory, your prefrontal cortex is talking to your language area when you're trying to translate from a conversation from one language to another. Or maybe you're trying to remember a fact that you want to share with someone. So your working memory has to talk to your long-term memory. That involves a sparker to spark that communication from one part of the brain to another. So we need that plasticity, that, that, uh, that sparking effect happening. And omega-3s are one of the most scientifically proven ways to get that. You can see here, studies show that adults will benefit from food once a week. So not a whole lot. If you can integrate a, a, a rich, um, DHA-rich, food into your eating on a weekly basis. Salmon, mackerel um, is a great benefit, so great sources of that. Now, I do want to point out that the um, studies suggest that adults don't benefit from supplements of DHA in the same way that children will benefit fit from a supplement. So if you're working, if you, if you have children or you uh, are working with children, supplements are a great source of um, DHA omega-3 for children. But as an adult, our body seems to process those benefits, those brain benefits much better from an actual food source. I've also thrown in something a little on the side. Um, a lot of my research has looked at memory and different learning needs like ADHD, autism, dyslexia, and so on. I won't get into that today. I, I actually did, um, I published a whole children's book series on the learning superpowers of children with ADHD and autism. So we, we kind of flip the switcher, look at their strengths, their memory strengths. But we do know that um, omega-3 fish oil supplements are also highly effective in reducing ADHD symptoms. And this is a review of over 52 studies. So a very robust and powerful finding. So a little, a little additional information here. I know it's not quite the memory field, but um, as I said, my area of research expertise does involve these populations. And I'm always excited when I see ways in which we can change our daily habits to improve attention and memory. Now let's look a little bit at the moderate side of things. What brain hacks can we use to have that work on a moderate basis? So we're not talking weeks here, maybe a little bit sooner than that. Let's take a look. Now, one hack is to sleep on it. And there's a growing body of research to show that when you learn new information just before bedtime, your brain will actually lock that information into your memory. And you'll be able to remember that much more efficiently than if you learned that same information at the beginning of the day or even in the middle of the day. So uh, this is an easy thing to do if you find yourself having to learn, maybe study for an exam or learn something new, try doing that just before bedtime. A couple of reasons uh, researchers suggest. One, there's a lack of interference. When, when you learn in the beginning of the day, you have a lot of new information that's coming at you throughout the day that can interfere and kind of push out that new information you're learning or you're studying. But when you learn before bedtime, you, you're kind of learning in a bit of a bubble, a bit of a capsule, and you're sleeping right on it. So you're locking that information in and helping consolidate that. So sleeping on it is a, a moderately acting tip. Just, you know, if you, if you sleep anywhere from six to eight hours, you can see benefits to your memory for learning new information. 
Another tip here, and uh, this is based on a number of different pieces of research that I've published. Uh, it was featured in, in uh, avenues like Men's Health and, and various other scientific uh, popular journals as well, all available on my website too. Um, but we found that moving naturally, if you have a playground and you're able to kind of climb around and do things like balancing, we found an improvement in 20% uh, improvement in memory. Um, following, just playing and having a little fun and moving naturally. And one of the reasons for that, um, excuse me, one of the reasons for that is because of something called proprioception. And proprioception refers to your body's awareness of its position in space. So when you're climbing or when you're balancing, you know, doing things like that, you are constantly engaging your working memory to think of where to put your hands, where to put your feet, and these are great ways um, to improve your memory. So the uh, uh, Forbes ran a feature on it, looking at um, my study right there on how things like um, rock climbing also involves that proprioceptive element that can improve your memory. So lots of fun ways if you, if you do like rock climbing and um, rather be indoors and climb a tree, lots of options to actually have a fun way to show improvements in your working memory. And, and we saw benefits after, again, on the same day of that activity. Now, the other thing that um, a moderate acting thing here, now this is uh, not my research, it's done by a colleague of mine in Japan. And what uh, he did was he had his participants wear a, a cap, a little hat on their head with um, sensors to measure the activity, the brain activity, blood flow activity, when they were walking at various paces. And here you can see a nice, slow jog here, nice, good pace here. Not, not a sprint, just a nice jog. And if you remember, we talked about working memory happening in the front of the brain, the prefrontal cortex. So you can see when you're doing, when you're running or jogging, you are increasing blood flow to the front of your brain right here. And this can have benefits to your working memory. Now, I wanted to take this a step further. I love running. I love barefoot running on the beach. I, I typically do this every morning. I was out this morning too in, in the rain, enjoying a little barefoot run on the beach, watching the sunrise um, since I live on the East Coast. And I wanted to know, um, as someone who enjoys running and also a psychologist, would we see benefits to our memory from this activity? So I worked together with our College of Health here at the university. We recruited people and they ran in four different ways. Barefoot, as you can see from this picture, with shoes. We also, if you've noticed, you can see these little chips in the ground that we placed. We wanted to mimic what it would be like to run barefoot. Now, if you've ever taken your shoes off and walked barefoot on the grass or on sand, you would notice that you're probably a little extra attentive. You don't want to step on some shells or pebbles or sticks or twigs and so on. And so we wanted to put these, uh, these little, uh, little chips on the ground and encourage them to step on the chips as the safe part of where to land their feet. So when we wanted to mimic what it would be like to run barefoot, even though they were on an indoor track. And for ethical reasons, we couldn't have them uh, run outside for our, our ethics board from a research perspective. So this was the next best thing. So again, they ran barefoot uh, with their shoes, with the chips on the ground and without the chips on the ground. So as I said, four different ways. Now here's what we found, that there were a few things that made a difference. We found that just 16, that's one six minutes of runtime improved their working memory significantly. We also found that attention matters, that their memory only improved when they had to run, when there were chips on the ground. So when there were no chips and they were running barefoot, it didn't matter because they didn't have to focus their attention. But when they had to actually land on these chips and keep a tally of how many chips they were landing on, that improved their memory. And um, <clears throat> so that's an important thing. Running barefoot for 16 minutes where you're focusing your attention on, you know, landing that. And so imagine, you know, when you're a kid, think back to when you're a kid and maybe you would try to jump on the sidewalk, trying to avoid the cracks or try to step on the cracks and so on. That would be a fun example of how these poker chips come to play where you're being very intentional in focusing your attention as you're running. Now that's a quick 16 minute way to boost your memory. Here's another fun one. Um, 
um, I, I found that, uh, so excuse me, some researchers, uh, some colleagues of mine up in, um, I believe it was um, Detroit, they found in Michigan, they found that when people would walk outside in a park on their lunchtime, their working memory was significantly improved, just, just a short walk. And they attributed that to what they call art, an attention restorative theory. In other words, being in nature, even if it's an urban park, has this sort of ability to restore your attention, calm you down and reset your memory and attention. So if you, um, even if you're working from home during these unusual times, I would highly recommend if you can just even step outside for a short time and, and look at the trees, look at the, the flowers, you know, make your way to a park if that's, if that's um, accessible or possible for you. That's a quick way to get that memory reset in the middle of your day. Uh, and the final kind of moderate memory hack I want to give you is color and draw. And this is from my own research. It was also featured uh, in our uh, various newspapers here when it came out. But I found that just 20 minutes of coloring a mandala for older adults, they uh, found significant, they showed significant improvement. So really powerful here um, for this is the over 65s that we were working with and the mandala itself is very calming this is an example of the exact mandala that we used in our published research and as i said coloring this mandala just for 20 minutes showed a significant improvement to older adults um, for young to middle uh, age adults we found that drawings so just having a blank sheet of paper and saying you know what i'm going to draw something for 20 minutes now you may think, well, I'm not an artist. I don't really want to do this. Don't worry. You don't have to show your art to anyone. But just that act of drawing is very good for your working memory because it involves you having to use your working memory to plan what you want to draw, think of what you want to draw and so on. So very effective in that respect. Now, the moment you've all been waiting for, the quick hacks. Let's say you don't have 20 minutes to color or 16 minutes to go for a quick barefoot run outside. Well, what can you do? Um, this is what I call the 10 second list. Now, you remember in the beginning of this presentation, I talked about that pathway between our uh, working memory, our prefrontal cortex and our long term memory our hippocampus and how as we get older that pathway starts deteriorating and we often have a lot of word finding difficulties it's a common indicator for uh, alzheimer's and dementia well one way to keep that pathway um, working efficiently is doing a game playing a game that i call the 10 second list give yourself 10 seconds and list as many things as you can in 10 seconds so let's take a moment if we have 10 seconds, list as many fruits as you can think of. You may, you know, go strawberries, blueberries, um, blackberries, apples, oranges, pears, grapes, and so on. Uh, you can change the, uh, you know, uh, category animals. You can make it more narrow. Animals at a zoo, animals that fly, uh, food you eat with your fingers, really anything you want. The, the goal of the game here is just it, it works on what we call semantic fluency which simply means that you are increasing your brain's connection between your working memory and your long-term memory. You're making that link more fluent, more efficient. So it's easier to remember information. That's a quick 10 second game that you can play anywhere you are. The, another thing that you can do that is fast acting is to smell or breathe deep. And um, various research has shown that essential oils, specifically peppermint and rosemary, are a great way to activate acetylcholine, which is a memory neurotransmitter. And um, it's also the first thing to deteriorate as we get older. So acetylcholine, uh, having a little peppermint and rosemary, maybe as you're learning something new, maybe you want to remember something new, this, this in a diffuser or even a couple drops, not on your, not on your bare skin, but on a little Kleenex. It is, it is highly potent. So on a little tissue or Kleenex or even a, a, a collar, what you're wearing can really activate the acetylcholine, which is your memory neurotransmitter.
Um, I did mention these children's books that I uh, that I was I'm so excited to have been uh, able to do that. One of them has actually been animated and was uh, shortlisted for Netflix. So I was very excited about that. Um, essentially, all of these books focus on the memory superpower of children with different learning needs. So we have dyslexia, ADHD, anxiety and autism and all of them are also available on Amazon. So different different approach to looking at how we can improve memory in our children that have learning needs. And, and the, the back of the book does have memory tips as well specific to these learning needs. So another opportunity for you to find ways to boost your children's memory as well. So um, a little bit of information. You, I'd love if you connect with me on social media. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. That's my handle right there, Dr. Tracy Alloway. And my website with more resources for my books and videos and uh, various things like that can all be available there. Uh, I'm really excited to have been able to share with you today. I'm going to stop my screen share at this point here and uh, come back and start my video. And so I get a chance to look at you guys and answer any questions and um, just uh, check, check in with Ginger and, and see um, what you'd like us to do going forward. Hi, thank you so much. I don't know if you could see my reactions, but like, <laughs> I was like driving with you. I was like, oh, <laughs> I'm a super setter or whatever it was called. <laughs> super <taster. laughs> But I don't actually think I am. I think I'm a terrible multitasker. <laughs> I hate doing that. I just feel like I have to be a multitasker all the time, you know? <laughs> well, um, the the Facebook is on like maybe a 20 second delay. So we'll give people a chance. If you have a question for uh, Dr. Uh, do you like to be called Dr. Alloway or Dr. Tracy? Yeah. It's I'm like a Dr. Phil kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so if you have a question for her, um, you know, her, she's the brain hack queen. I have a couple questions that I was thinking ahead, like the different people that were in my audience. So I'm going to ask some and you guys type it in the chat and I, I will read it to her. Um, is there anything uniquely special about, we're not talking about people that have been multilingual since they were children. Mm -hmm. We're talking about adults that have added Almost everybody on my summit was trilingual, at mm. least. Isn't that amazing? That is. Um, myself included. Um, you mentioned Kazakhstan. I've taught English there. Can you believe that? I but I still couldn't there, spell it backwards. That was not <laughs> that. That's wonderful. <laughs> but I was wondering if, um, and I speak Japanese and Spanish, and um, uh, and most of the other people spoke at least two languages, if not three. It was really amazing. Um, but. Uh, is there anything unique about the adult multilingual brain that might kind of give us, I don't know, like a, a level up on um, our thinking patterns, our neural pathways? Is there anything special about our brains that helps us be achievers or more successful? Um, yeah, one of the things is that, you know, when you learn as, as a child, when you learn multiple languages as a child, you often learn in tandem. And so that um, that develops in tandem, whereas here your connections are much stronger when you learn as an adult, that that link between your working memory and long term memory tends to be a lot stronger because you're mapping that new language onto what you already know. So you know, Ginger, you mentioned you speak Japanese. So I'm guessing you learned that as an adult, you may look at a cup and bring that, that so it's highly fluent, you're bringing that word up and then learning something new. Exactly. <laughs> there you go. So we have the, you know, as adults who learn a second language, you have the benefit of having a much stronger link, which can then act as a buffer as we age. Remember, we talked about that link between our working memory and long-term memory being one of the first um, pathways to start deteriorating as we get older. Well, that's less so um, for a bilingual adult speaker. Ah. Huh. Oh, that's so interesting. Mm -hmm. um, there's a good question in the chat, and I love this. I was going to ask about this because I think it's something that everybody suffers with these days, especially adults. Um, what about John Hardy asks, what about stuff to reduce adults' anxiety when they focus on too many things and jump around too much on too many subjects? Can't seem to focus. 
Totally. Yeah, that is a great question. And I have published research. I've worked with colleagues that have published research. So if your working memory space is this big, but you also struggle with anxiety, you're cutting that space at least in half. So when you take a memory test, you may say, you know, my memory is fine, but that anxiety uses up a lot of that memory space. So think of test anxiety or performance anxiety. Um, and there's lots of, you know, that's a whole nother presentation, but there's lots of ways to be able to work with anxiety, everything from breathing to one thing that I love, and I talk about this in my children's book, is to, if you have performance anxiety, is to imagine yourself doing that presentation, playing that game, whatever it is that you have that anxiety about from start to finish. So if you have to give a presentation tomorrow mm -hmm. and already mm -hmm. you start thinking, I'm going to forget stuff. I'm going to drop my cards. I just, I don't know that I can juggle with Zoom, the PowerPoint, looking at the video. Do that thing in your head. So close your eyes. Do that, that thing that you're worried about, that you're anxious about from start to finish. Imagine all the details. And what that does is it tricks your brain into thinking, I've done it. It wasn't so bad. I wasn't too nervous. So when you have to do it for real, your brain's already told you that I've done it once. Why are you so worried about it? And that's like a quick... You know, that's a, a great way to, uh, again, a hack to kind of trick your brain into dealing with that anxiety ahead of time without actually doing it first. Mm, it's really good. It's uh, what is the, um, we were talking about this book, First Things First, uh, mm -hmm. with one of the other uh, speakers. And um, uh, he says, begin with the end in mind. It's a mm -hmm. lot like that, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Stephen, Covey, yeah. Stephen Covey is the one. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's so good. Um, it, there was a lot of entrepreneurs, realtors, authors, mm -hmm. what I like to call leaders, launchers, and learners on uh, my summit. And mm -hmm. um, I think it's really important for us to be able to imagine the end, like the, a successful ending. Mm -hmm. uh, be, uh, and just as you said, uh, because it gives your brain the chance to say, Oh, you've already done it. It's okay. <laughs> so you can just do it again now. <laughs> it's so good. Okay. Here's another question. Uh, Charlie Mike says, what about when I am on a train of thought, then I just completely lose my train of thought. So frustrating. It is. And oftentimes that has to do more with an overload. So in other words, it's not that your memory is failing you is that we're juggling too many things. It's back to that game we played of driving as well as remembering numbers at the same time. You have added so many things in your mix. Like you, maybe you're driving to the store, thinking of your, your shopping list and then thinking of a phone call you have to make and then that email that you have to respond to. And that has pushed things um, kind of off the board. So one way to do that is just backtrack and think so there's a lot of research uh, called uh, state memory, state dependent memory. Think of where you were when you were thinking of that particular activity. So if you think, you know what, my boss told me I need to do X and I don't remember what X is. Well, where were you standing when you were talking to your boss? And just simply remembering that location and that's that, that kind of place uh, dependent memory can unlock that piece of information that you're missing. So it's not so mm. much that you've forgotten is that the key that you are currently holding isn't the right key. So you have to think, can I think of my emotional state? What, what was I happy when I was having this conversation? Was I you know, try to recreate that or recreate the location you were at? And again, lots of research to show that, you know, when even students, when they're studying for an exam and they constantly study maybe in their living room, um, if they can kind of remember their living room, close your eyes before they're actually sitting in that testing environment, it can bring that information back to them. That's so interesting. Um, he's saying, wow. <laughs> brain <laughs> overload wow <laughs> um and john said thank you um uh you made me think of something so i probably need more uh salmon this morning because i i just forgot it just slipped my mind um i love salmon i was so happy to hear about that that i need the food version because i do take a lot of supplements but i'm really glad about that uh, this is very similar so you might have already answered it but um i almost could have renamed the summit without knowing it, you know, 15 different countries, speakers from so many different niches, okay? Mm -hmm. I probably could have renamed it, get clear and confident mm -hmm. on your purpose or your calling. Uh, everybody was talking in some aspect or another about clarity. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it occurred to me, um, is a stressed and confused brain that is not clear 
on their goal or who they are, um, does it obstruct your success? And if so, how can you, um, how can, I don't know, mitigate that or overcome it? Yeah, that's a great question. And actually that's the whole thing that I talk about in my new book, Think Like a Girl. Yay! But <laughs> one of the things, so however you define success, and again, we're gonna make it relative to the individual. So obviously what is right. successful for A would be different for B and so on. But what the key thing is, regardless of how you define that, one of the things that I found in my own research, and this was a few hundred people, men and women, different ages, was that your sense of agency is really critical. So agency is what can you do? So if you um, if you are encountering, let's just take a workplace environment. If you go in, you think, you know what? My boss is always critical. I just can't ever do the right thing. Or, you know, I have a, I'm a, a teacher. I, my students are just, I'm, it's just tough. I don't know how to do Zoom. I, there's a lot of things that I'm battling with now in this new environment that shift of focus can really lead to a deterioration in your mental health, your stress, your anxiety levels, and ultimately your mm. depression. Mm. That's one of the key things that I found consistently. So by reshifting that to agency, which is simply the question, what can I do? Ah, so saying, what can't I do? So you, you know, all the things I said, well, I can't see my students in person. I can't teach them art, you know, face to face and have that fun uh, engagement with them. Sure, fine, that's all out of your control. What can you do? Um, and shifting that back to agency makes a huge difference. I know uh, some of your listeners may also have a very strong um, God belief or religious focus. And again, that's lots of research. And I talk about this in my book, Think Like a Girl, that people who do have a very strong spiritual center, wh whichever, you subscribe to, you also have the sense of agency, that there is someone that is giving you that strength to carry through. So again, just, just a simple shift in the question can make a big difference to what can I do? Just ask yourself that when you are feeling overwhelmed before you start spiraling down to stress and feeling like, you know, I had these goals in 2020, now I can't do any of these things. <laughs> all of us, that's all of us, right? Yeah. Uh, so shift that question to what can I do now? You know, you've got another month left. What can you do to finish the year strong? It's so good. We have another month left. Yeah, it's what I had to do. Mm -hmm. Lost all my jobs during the pandemic. All the international students left. Uh, mm -hmm. The smaller private school I had another job with um, didn't have enough students mm -hmm. to give me a class. And so I just, I had to make the hard pivot after <laughs> I cried. <laughs> yeah, and that's important too. You have to let yourself feel that emotion. Absolutely. Yeah. Then I pivoted, you know. Um, does anybody else have any any more questions? I really appreciate that um, when you're saying um, reshifting to agency, mm -hmm. that um, you have to focus on what you can control to be able to move ahead. That too many of us, I think, I called it emotional resiliency during mm -hmm. the um, the long summit, the 13 hour one. And um, cause a lot of people talked about that. Like my big hitters that are succeeding, mm -hmm. they would talk about that. Like you have to manage what you can manage, you yeah. know? Yeah, so, exactly. and that's part of the reason I put on this huge summit was yeah. hopefully to, um, oh, there's one more. Okay, I heard once, oh yes, this is, this is one of my amazing, uh, he was, he's a former student from Brazil and he's asking a question. Sure. I heard once that to sleep, listening to a podcast or a lesson when we are learning a new subject or a new language, for instance, helps to accelerate the process of learning. Is that true? Um, you know, sleep is funny in that we don't know a lot about what actually happens when we sleep. So I work a lot with um, sleep disorders in the context of, of children, developmental uh, populations, and how that ultimately affects their, their working waking hours, their memory and, and attention and learning in school. And there's so much we don't know what exactly is happening when we're learning. We do know that our front of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, does power down. So it's allowing more um, the part of the brain that's associated with with free expression, the daydreaming part of the brain to kick in. And that's oftentimes why you sometimes hear people, you know, maybe working on a project just before bed, not finding a solution, and then they sleep on it. You may have heard that phrase, I, I slept on it. And then I woke up and I was like, aha, now I know what I'm gonna do. I know what I'm gonna write, I know what I'm gonna paint and so on. 
And that's a big reason because of how our brain shifts our, uh, our activity. We power down that front of the brain where we're co consuming information and we power up our, what would sometimes <laughs> called our free expression, our, our, our consciousness. Um, mm -hmm. That's the part of the brain that when you look at jazz musicians, when they're riffing, or they're, they're kind of playing uh, without mm -hmm. actually following music, that's the part of the brain that's being activated. Some people call it the creative brain. Um, and that's what's a little bit louder uh, while we're sleeping, which can help us then uh, solve or work through a creative problem you might be having. I was listening to um, a, a different speaker. He was talking about what your brain waves do just yeah. before you sleep and just when you wake up. Yeah. that it's really important what you're doing right before you sleep and right when you wake up. And it doesn't that tie back into what you said earlier that um, doing something just before bed, mm -hmm. can, can you recap that a teeny bit? Yeah, of course. So that was one of the hacks, the moderate acting hack. If you're learning something new, maybe learning a new language or, uh, you know, learning some information for work or for school, try learning it just before bedtime. And that locks in that, that memory. So not, it's a little different than uh, the question about listening to it as you're sleeping. You're awake, you're learning that information and then you're, you're sleeping on it. That's awesome. I, I'm just so grateful. And he's saying, thank you. He's giving you the little thank you. <laughs> he's really an incredible individual himself. Um, his, uh, his fiance was my featured nutritionist from Brazil. Wonderful. <laughs> thing yesterday, so, I mean, Friday. So, Thank you so much. Um, imagining the end from the beginning, using your working memory, some brain hacks, uh, sustainers, boosters, and sparkers. Go back through the chat, you guys, because I'm I was constantly like typing great little summaries of what you were sa you're saying into the chat. That's why I was like sideways, <laughs> <laughs> but I was multitasking. There you go. You're <laughs> like Ginger, you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> It's amazing I learned anything at all. <laughs> well, I'm just so grateful that you shared with us today, Tracy, taking out so much of your time. I miss you. I haven't seen you in decades. This is true. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be able to be part of this wonderful group that you've, you've brought together for the summit. I appreciate the invite. Yeah, you're welcome. It's my honor too. So I just want to remind everybody before we um, go off the live, it, you can hang in there if you want to, um, that um, the, uh, the recordings will stay up in the Transform Your Life Summit page till Tuesday at midnight. And um, for anybody who really wants to get <laughs> clear and confident, um, about their their purpose or they need a good strategy. I am offering as my love gift, I have 20 more uh, sessions on my coaching program that I'm giving away for free, one whole hour. So if there's no charge, there's no excuse, mm -hmm. I will help you get clear and confident on um, who you are, where you're going, what your next three steps are. That's what I hope you will get before you leave that conversation, a very clear strategy on at least three things you can do to get clear and confident. And I hope you will be very blessed by that. So it's in the calendar and I'll post it again in the, the chat for you guys. It's a special link on my uh my acuity scheduler. So um, make sure you go back and watch at least the speakers that you totally love and totally go back over Dr. Tracy Packiam Alloway's amazing session this morning. I mean, she, she brought the fire. That was amazing. So practical in so many areas and how we can use our working memory actually mm -hmm. to be more successful. So um, if, if I've served you, if any of these friends that I have across the world have served you, then um, go ahead and jump in there and give yourself the gift of your focus and um, a clear strategy. We have 30 more days. We have a whole month to show up in 2021 as the person we need to be to live the life that we want, right? We still have 30 days. Don't throw away 2020 yet. <laughs> great advice, so, great advice. <laughs> I hope to see you soon, Tracy. Maybe you can teach me how to barefoot skateboard. I would totally love that. <laughs> Thanks again for having me and bye everyone. <laughs> bye. Thank you. And let's see here. Oh, I don't think I can. Can I reclaim host? She's still the host. Oh, it's me.
Okay, good. Am I still live over there? Yeah, you are. <laughs> okay. So anyways, guys, thank you so much. For those of you who are watching live, I really appreciate it. And all the uh, uh, engagements, I really appreciate all that chatter. And um, for those of you who are catching the replay, worth every minute, worth every minute, go back and watch all of that. And um, uh, so please, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll add that calendar again. I would really love to serve you. If you are one of those people that needs clarity on who you are or what you're offering or what next steps you're taking before um, 2021 gets here or as 2021 gets here, or you need a strategy, you just want a friend to talk to and hash it out. That's my, um, that's my love gift to you. So please take advantage of it. I think I have 20 spots left out of the 25 I was offering. Um, so that can that calendar will be up on the transform your life uh, page. You should see my picture in there so you know that it's me and um, I'll be happy to serve you. So grab that before midnight tomorrow so you can have that for free. Uh, it's uh, a valuable offer. I don't know many people who would give you a whole hour of their coaching time. So that would be my gift to you guys. Um, and as a thank you for joining and also um, to launch this next pivot in my own life that I've had to make. So. You guys have a wonderful day and I will um, I will see you in the chats. Bye.